Are you struggling with roadblocks as a woman in the challenging and constantly changing world of corporate America? If you feel stuck in your career, you may be holding yourself back and may not even realize it. Prepare to be enlightened by the meaningful discussions here at the No Woman Left Behind podcast. Each week, gather the insight you need to break down those walls of limiting beliefs. Unleash your full potential and unlock the leader within. Listen to raw conversations with corporate women as they share inspiring stories with the purpose of obtaining their dream career and living a truly fulfilling life. Here's your host, Rosie Zielinskas. Hey everyone, welcome back. In this episode, we dive into the challenges and opportunities for women in STEM careers. Our guest shares her personal journey of being the only woman in the room and how she made the decision to break free from the corporate world and start her own company. We discuss the importance of sharing ideas and experimenting to spark creativity and innovation. Plus, we explore the need for outside coaching and perspectives to help advance in your career. So let me tell you a little bit about Lisa. Lisa Levy is a three-time number one best-selling author. In her book, Future Proofing Cubed, she shares her insights on productivity, profitability, and process refinement in business. Lisa's goal is to prepare her clients with the skills, capabilities, and self-reliance they need to thrive in the future without LQ's guidance. So Lisa is trying to actually put herself out of business by making her clients more productive and efficient. If you are a woman in STEM or interested in the experiences of women in the corporate world, this episode is for you. Tune in now for Lisa's inspiring story and actionable advice. Do you feel that you're spinning your wheels and advancing your career slower than you'd like? Well, I got you because I have a free quiz to help you figure out how you may sabotage your career advancement. Our free quiz is designed to help you identify the common pitfalls preventing you from reaching your career goals. The quiz is 100% free and it only takes three minutes to complete. Take the quiz now to start taking control of your career today. The link is on the episode website. And now let's head back to today's conversation. Hey, Lisa, thank you so much for being here today. How are you in your neck of the woods? Rosie, thank you so much for having me here. I am fabulous. It is like almost fall weather and it doesn't get much better than that. Thanks for inviting me to the conversation. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. So you and I had launched just about a month ago in Phoenix and I found myself being in a sweltering 150 degree heat. <laughs> And that was insane. I felt like I was walking in an oven. <laughs> and I picked a restaurant that's kind of like indoor outdoor experience. Yes. So it wasn't exactly like cool to sit and enjoy like air conditioning. So, you know, local's yeah. bad choice. Oh, it was it was great just to talk to you, meet you in person. So I'm excited to have a conversation with you today. So as you will know, you know, Woman Left Behind is catering to women in the corporate world that are trying to advance in their careers. And I thought your story was just so perfect to talk about in the in the show because it is exemplary of what women, especially women in, in the STEM field, are experiencing even today. There's still so many women that are like, yes, I was the only woman in, in the room and so I know that for you, um, you started, obviously you have your company now, but your, your career started in the corporate STEM world and technology. And at one point, you were kind of fed up with the corporate world and you started off on, on your own. But I remember you telling me a story of you being one of the only women in, in the corporate space. And you really wanted the title of director. And this was in your early 30s, if I recall. So tell me why you were at that point that you were seeking that title. And then what happened after? All right. So, yes, I was in my very, very early 30s, like maybe just 30. And 
I had my background is in IT, specifically in project management. And I had spent the beginning of my career running projects and seeing that they don't always work, right? Things get implemented and people and end users are unhappy with technology um, systems. And I wanted to build a project management team that was really dedicated to getting results that our customers, our end users wanted out of our technology solutions. So that really meant I needed to lead the project management office. And that meant I needed that title of director so that I was in that layer of management in the organization where I really had influence. And I don't want to say authority and I don't want to say power because those things are, I think, kind of illusions, but I wanted influence. And so it was really something that I fought for because the title manager was much more commonplace. And it took me about 18 months of delivering projects that were successful with the team and growing into being noticed by the the C-suite, by the executive team, where I could then sort of negotiate for the title of director of project management. It was really critical on two fronts. So it was for me to achieve something and I was young and I was hungry and I was passionate. And I was also the only female in IT management at all. And I didn't realize the impact of what that would mean when I took that next step up into this next tier of leadership. But once I had the director title and I sat down at the first leadership meeting, I'm the only woman there. And even that doesn't feel particularly odd to me because in the IT department of roughly 100 people, if there were 10 women total, I might be being a bit generous. And of those women, most of them were in support functions and not necessarily technologists. So it wasn't unusual, but I'm sitting at that table and we're having that first kind of around the table conversation about ideas and things that we should be doing. And oh my gosh, Rosie, I had a bazillion ideas <laughs> and my mouth is running and I'm looking and I, you know, I've got Bob and Jim and Carl and, and I'm talking and the boss, Lisa, that's enough. We can take this offline and have a conversation in my office. Okay. So the meeting went on and everybody we did, you know, whatever we do in weekly status meetings. And afterwards he said, let's, let's take it to my office. I said, okay. We sat down and he got this grumpy face and he looked at me and he said, if I really want you to give me ideas, we'll have them in this conversation one-on-one. And if they're good enough, I'll take them to the whole team. That was that was probably the look on my face. And I was dumbfounded and speechless. And speechless doesn't come naturally to me. So do you, I think, was, do you think he just kind of wanted you to, like, what was his intention by telling you that? Like, typically, we want people on our teams to give us ideas, right? So this is kind of an old school command and control mindset. He was the boss. Everything starts at the top and goes downhill. He will tell us what to do. He will tell us how to do it, especially in his interaction with me. What I started to find over time was when I had a really cool idea, I would test it amongst my peers and kind of see what they thought about the idea. And then I would position one of them to take it forward in the team meetings. So I was building allies and they were getting results. These ideas started to get traction as long as they didn't originate from me in a group setting. At the time... I'm right 31 years old. My ideas are getting traction. I don't care how it's happening. And I was thrilled until that senior director was his title at the time. Our boss became vice president of technology on the output of the work that we were doing that he was taking credit for. Three years later, he was the CIO of the company. And these were all your ideas. They were not just my ideas, right? But my ideas are a large part of it. And the results of the team of project managers delivering exceptional results. And he was taking the credit and building his base and his career on our work. And that devastated me. Absolutely devastated me. And what when I kind of came back to this story recently, it was for um, a writing project, the Lady Diversity Power book that I contributed to was to share this story, right? How I started. And that first moment of, wait, something isn't right about this. And I started doing some research. And, you know, the only woman at the table is a hard place to be. And that was my experience. But if you are a double only, 
if you are a female who is African American, if you are a female who is gay, if you are a female trans, if you are a female Asian, right, it gets exponentially harder to make these career jumps. I know with 100% certainty, I this is 20 years later, literally exactly 20 years later, I could be in that exact same space with probably a title of maybe assistant vice president in that organization today. That would have been maybe two promotions 20 years later. Had to do something different. So what was the catalyst, do you think, of, I always wonder, when other people take your idea and they pass it as their own, what recourse, if any, do we have? So you're looking back on that experience and other things that I've done through my career, right? Allyship is critical. We all need allies. We need counterparts who have our back, who are our sounding board, but we also need them to truly be allies. We need them to give credit where credit is due. And even if they're the one bringing it up and getting it started, right? Saying, hey, by the way, this was really Rosie's idea. I'm just sort of pushing it forward because I thought I could help make it happen, right? So it's a sports reference, right? We need people to take the assist, yeah, right? We need them to get the, by all means, they get the credit for doing the assist and getting the oomph, that first, you know, that first momentum and getting something moving. But it's really critical that they then say, and oh, by the way, I didn't come up with this by myself in that Rosie did. And isn't it brilliant? And I am so thrilled to help make it real. And we all right come together because all of these things are collaborative ultimately. And isn't it great that we're all making a difference? Yeah, absolutely. Now, I know at one point I heard you say that your career was kind of being managed a little bit haphazardly until you took control of it. How did you even recognize that? Because one of the things that I'm really trying to bring awareness to women is that their career cannot be on autopilot. They have to manage their careers intentionally. So at what point in your career did you realize that, hey, I really need to create a plan and follow a plan? When when did that come into play for you? Okay, so let's a couple of pieces. Let's remember that I am a trained project manager, right? That is the first skill set that I developed in my professional career. Then I built on process management and understanding how things work, right? The understanding of all of this. So I am very, very, very much a systems and logic oriented business person. I happen to be learning at this stage of my life that I'm also kind of wacky and crazy and creative. (laughs) When I put it all together, it's much more interesting. But In my corporate career, I was very much system and process oriented, wanted, had a plan, had a five-year plan. That wasn't meaningful, but it got me to that director title at 31 years of age. And so, right, that was, there are are little pieces of it, but then I sort of lost track of the plan because I was on, I was on the path now, right? So that process part, I was hoping that it would just, the momentum would keep it going. I left that job that we were talking about because it wasn't a place where I was going to blossom and thrive and joined a team that was a startup. They were well-funded and we used to call it a rocket ship. It was ready to launch and everything was going. It was truly my dream job. Somewhat entrepreneurial, right? A little bit of that startup vibe, which was new. Terrifying because I was there and my purpose of being there was to put some systems and process in place so that that company could grow and scale on purpose with purpose. I thought I had everything that I wanted until I realized every day as I was driving into work, I was crying because I didn't want to be there. I hated everything about it. And it was, I was becoming a smaller and smaller version of myself with each passing day. So what, what, why? It was my dream job. I was building a team of project and program managers who were worried and concerned about the customer. We were building the processes to grow and scale. We were doing everything that we were supposed to be doing. And yet above us in the organization was a C-suite of individuals, rugged individualists who were all there to build their fiefdom, the best sales organization, the best technology organization, the best operations, the best contact center care. And they weren't collaborating with each other. And they each had teams of consultants surrounding them, building those fiefdoms up 
to be the best that they could possibly be. And my charter and my purpose was to be cross-functional and to make the organization as a whole effective and efficient. In the last six months that I worked for that company, I reported, no, in the last six months, I reported to about four different C-level executives. In the last 18 months, I did a round robin and I reported to almost every C-level that existed in that company because they didn't know what to do with the team that was being designed to break down all the silos and actually make them work in a collaborative environment. I was livid. I was frustrated. I was exhausted. I talk about it often like being on the roller coaster from hell, the twists and the turns. I had no idea what was going to happen next. I was nauseated almost every single day until I had an aha moment. And I was I was at the breaking point and I said, enough. I took this job because I wanted to grow a career in a corporation. I wanted a career path. I wanted a 401k. I wanted paid time off. I wanted a sense of safety and security and a place where I could grow and, and blossom and be the best version of Lisa I could be. And I realized that that idea is a myth. And unless I take full control of what I want and how I'm going to get there, I am at the whim of every other person that I ever work for. And in some cases, you know, work with depending on how, you know, how supportive or combative peer groups are in the environment. And I decided to take a different path. I chose an entrepreneurial path and created L Cubed Consulting out of that experience. That was a hard decision. It was scary. I was single. I have no children. So financially, I knew what the operating model needed to look like, but I didn't have a deep pocket of reserves. I just sort of took a swing and went for it to build a consulting team that would focus on our clients, their customers, and doing the right things for the right reasons. I love that last line that you said, doing the right things for the right reasons. And I've been in the corporate world for over 30 years. I, you know... In companies, there's these seasons, right? It's like you try this thing, it doesn't work. Then you try this thing, it doesn't work. And it's almost like that roller coaster that you're saying. And we did the silo thing where like there were like each region has its own like VP and all the directors, but none of these people are talking to these people. And then you have no idea what anybody's doing (laughs) And, and people are working the same projects so then they break all that down, then they start trying to collaborate again. And it's just like, and the the sad part is that they do it again. <laughs> it's like, and it's like, did they not learn? I, I, I don't understand from your experience, why does that happen, you know, from the corporate perspective where they silo things, they try to collaborate, it doesn't work. So what are your thoughts? I think that there's the real answer, right? Everything cycles. What was old becomes new again. We And I'm going to take this out of the corporate world into fashion, sure. right? We can look, right? We can look at colors as they come and go. We can look at, you know, how long are pants, how short are shorts. And, and there, are, there are cycles and everything sort of spirals through. And so I do think that it's natural that things evolve and change and that sometimes we learn and realize that some of the things we used to do were actually kind of valuable. Mm -hmm. We may not have done them well. We may not have implemented them fully, completely and correctly, but in a new iteration, there's actually meaning in some of that. And so I do think that it's important that we never stop learning. But I think what happens is we get stuck in this idea that there's one right way. And then we own it and we hold on to it for as long as we possibly can until it like truly fails and then it's that massive rebuild and we're going to and it's it's painful and it's big and it's there's seismic shifts in thinking and it doesn't have to be that hard. Mm-hmm. It can be a lot easier and a lot more natural. And part of the problem with some of those things when we do the big shifts is they're often from the top down, right? The leadership team says we're going to fill in the blank and then everybody goes, oh, we've already done that. It didn't work. Oh my gosh, that's going to make my job so much more difficult. Wouldn't it be better if we did, right? And you have all of these different answers and we we can absolutely do better than that if we really work as a collective team inside of a corporation and have processes for innovation 
if we have processes for continuous improvement, and just for the record, those two things connect if they're going to work well. And if we really listen to our customers, what they want, what they need, and our employees who interact with our customers, who really know what they want and what they need and how to get there, right? It, it should be ideas about what's next should come from the bottom up. Yeah. And there should be mechanisms for that to happen. It's so interesting that you say that because I was just tell, talking, I was just talking to somebody at work and I was like, I don't understand why the senior leaders never take the time to have a conversation with the people doing the work. It's like, it doesn't take like, you know, a thousand hours. It might take an hour or two, maybe a couple of times a year where you can just have a, hey, Q&A, let's, let me hear what you're thinking. <laughs> but it would make so much sense, you know, to actually have those open conversations. Well, right. Those open conversations, those times where you, you sit and listen to calls in the contact center, if it's you know, if you have brick and mortar locations, time where you go and you sit in the environment and you watch the interactions, all of that is a step in the right direction. But from those experiences, right, we have to learn things. Mm. We have to hear what's happening. We have to see what's working, what's not working. We need to listen to the input of how we could make it better, not just decide for ourselves, but right, really listen. And so I like to think of that and use the idea of I call it an innovation engine. And it is the input process to driving innovation throughout an entire business. And it starts with everybody having the ability to provide an idea. Yeah, It can be big, it can be obnoxious, it can be totally unattainable, but we need to share those ideas. And those big, obnoxious, most likely unattainable ones really are the catalysts that spark the creativity to get to something really cool that you actually can do. But we have to have those conversations and we have to play with those ideas. We have to prototype some of them. We have to test we have to experiment and see what happens when we play with those different variables so that we can figure out what we should be doing. Yeah. And that whole process for the business, and you, you were talking earlier about those big cycles where we, we start and we stop. Well, in the, in the business side of things, right, we have growth cycles and things get really, really good and then they, you know, they teeter off and then things get kind of bad. Well, if we have all of these new ideas as one growth cycle is ending, we can be building on the next one and then the next one. And so we don't ever have to have that big, heavy drop off. And that whole process is so critical when unexpected things happen because we already have all these different ideas that it's not a matter of, oh my gosh, what do we do? It's okay. We have these three options. Which one is going to be best? Absolutely. It's funny, in the insurance industry, we call that a hard market and a soft market. <laughs> you know, when it's a soft market, grow, grow, grow. Your loss ratio goes up. Then hard market, non renew, non renew, get off business. <laughs> it's just too funny. And by the way, I wanted to illustrate. It's so interesting because I just pulled up my, I was trying to figure out how to get my kids off of my phone plan. So I wanted to look at my bill and be like, okay, well, how much is each phone and whatever? I pull up my bill, my statement, and I just wanted to call. I wanted to talk to somebody. There is not one phone number in sight. And this is a phone company. It's one of the biggest companies that, you know, we're using. And there is not a phone number in sight. So it took me like 30 minutes to figure out that I could go on the chat and then request them to call me. And then I had to wait for them to call. And then I was on the phone with somebody else. And then I missed their call. It was so frustrating, Lisa. I was like, this is a phone company. This is a cell company. And they, like, the thought of them not putting their customer number on the statement is, it was just, I was flabbergasted. And then when I called it, when I finally got a phone number and I called it, they don't let you talk to a live person anymore. It's just, it's insanity. All right. What are those things, right? From a customer experience, they are a voice company, right? You should be interacting and talking on the telephone, on, on their platform, right? And, you know, dial the number and talk to somebody. 
What are they saying about how they value their customers? Oh, yeah, I don't matter. That, that's what I got out of it. Well, you don't care about my business because you don't want me to call you. That's insanity. Uh, I am curious. I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit back to like the the women that are in STEM, because that's kind of your specialty. If you were to do it over again, what would be some one or two things that you could tell these young women that are coming in STEM, that are going into STEM? Like, what are some key things that you at some point in your career thought, man, I wish I would have known that when I started my career? I am I am very excited to see what comes from our Generation Z. I have two of them in my family. They they aren't mine. They they came with the love of my life as teenagers. So I'm not res- I didn't create them. Hopefully I've had a positive influence on them. But they are coming in and came into the workforce, the first wave during the pandemic and had to be the most horrific way to enter professional careers as they are graduating from college, those that did the college path and starting to work in 2020, 2021. But they're coming forward with expectations of how they will be treated that I would never in a million years at their age have voiced. Hmm. The entire mindset is so different. I am so excited to see them flourish because they are going to change things. And so I like kind of looking at the generational things, right? I am a Gen Xer and we are kind of a smaller generation in the middle between the two big generations. And we just sort of did what we were told. Yes. We Same. sort of just hit the, right? we just sort of marched to the beat of the existing drum. And as women, we have made great strides into leadership and we've been able to do things, but we were not a force of nature, the way that the millennials were, who still get a really bad rep. But our millennial generations are now in their 40s, the the leading edge. They are leaders. They are directors. They are vice presidents. They are business owners. And they are not the rebel rousers problem makers that we give them credit for being. Gen Z is coming in with a voice and they are wanting to work. They want to work and they want to make an impact and they want to make a contribution but they're not willing to sell their souls for it. Mm -hmm. I sold my soul. And so if I can talk to that group that's emerging and especially women and women who are following a path in technology or engineering and science, the opportunities are endless. Find your voice, find your strength and ask for what you want. Reach for the jobs that you think you're not qualified for because there are studies that show Right. When two job candidates, a male and a female, read the same job description, women tend not to apply for that job unless they feel close to 100 percent certainty that they can do everything on that list. Our male counterparts are happy if they can do 60 percent of the things. So this is going to be a gross overstatement for the sake of impact. But those women who are choosing not to are most likely more qualified for the role than the men who are choosing to apply. And we're missing opportunities. Absolutely. I I actually saw on a job posting for a, a company based here in the Phoenix market, they had a blurb at the end of their job description that says, studies show that women will not apply for this job if they don't feel 100% confident. We're interested in the whole person. And if you are interested in this job, you should be applying. Wow. I had never seen anything like that. I came across it totally by accident. And it was the most uplifting thing I have seen in in ages. That's awesome. I love that. That's awesome. Now, interestingly enough, I don't know if you've noticed this with um, your um, kids, but they also talk salary. You know, when you and I started in the corporate world, it was massive taboo. You can't talk about it. You know, it's just not done. And even today, if I were to to talk to somebody like, no, it's like my brain is programmed. Like they programmed me to say, nope, can't talk salary. But all the young, I shouldn't say all the young, about 42% of Gen Zers talk about salary confidently and very openly with their peers And uh, it's funny, I heard a story of a woman and this was uh, she was leaving a company and she posted on Twitter, if you're applying for this company, you should not ask for less than one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. 
And that was her last day. And it was like, it blew up her Twitter because it was like one of the first times that people were like, oh, and then you can compare. And obviously there's um, also pay transparency law. So have you, have you heard the same thing, you know, with your, uh, with your kids? Well, just how freely they actually talk about it, even with us, right? I never told my parents what I was earning. In early jobs, it was not only did they discourage it, but they said it was a fireable offense. Yes, yes. Salaries are confidential, right? It was, you know, do not talk about them with anybody. We Well, well can you? Yeah. <laughs> so, it is really different and it is also really fun because going back to that first director role that I had, one of the other fabulous interactions I had with my my supervisor was as I was building a team and getting salaries and right getting everybody in in line, there was an individual who worked for me who made about 30% more than I made. Oh. And I was young, I early in my career, and my boss says to me, well, you're in management now. Management doesn't make what individual contributors are going to make in this space. You need to just be okay with it. What? <laughs> that doesn't even make any sense. Makes absolutely no sense. But I was like, uh, okay. I, you know, the guy was a high performer, right? His salary was fine. His salary wasn't the problem. Mm -hmm. His salary wasn't the problem at all. Yeah. And so with with my kids and when I speak at I, I sit on an advisory council for a, a, a business, a college of business up at NAU inside of the university. When I talk to the students in the fall every year, I do a you know, women in, in, in technology kind of talk. And seven years ago, I swore I would never give that talk again because I thought it was asinine that I was doing this every single year. And the reality is the talk needs to happen every single year because women going into STEM is still not at, you know, at, at a, there's no parity and we need more women in those fields. But I was, I'm so frustrated that we have to have that conversation. Right. And so it is it is absolutely important to your question, right, to step into things that might make you feel a little bit uncomfortable, stretch beyond what you think you're capable of doing, because we all grow in our jobs. We're expected to grow in our jobs. We are not hired to be perfect and perform at 100 percent of capability day one. So that is the key thing that I would talk to the you know, generation going into the workforce and those of you who've been in the workforce for five years. Mm -hmm. Really look at what, what you've done. Sit down, rewrite your resume if you've been in one job for five years and really look at what the difference is between who you were then and who you are now. Because I'm willing to wager it's pretty remarkable. Absolutely. And by the way, you can easily use ChatGPT to rewrite the your job description. I've been, uh, I actually just created a document for a, a group coaching course that I'm going to be doing in the fall. And it's just like five ways that you can amplify your career, your job search using chat GPT, because it is incredible. Now, I know that kind of pivoting to you a little bit and your book, tell me about your book and your company. And like, wh what do you, what are you doing in your company today? So absolutely. So the book that we're talking about, for those of you who aren't seeing it over my shoulders, Future Proofing Cubed, and it is a collection of stories about some really remarkable leaders who took ideas that I use as a foundational framework for how I run my business and how I work with my, my clients and, and consulting engagements. And it talks about adaptive transformation. And what that is, is leveraging project management process performance management, internal controls, and organizational change management. Those are big, huge, meaty best practices that are used in large organizations as standalone functions and departments. Like I've been talking about through all of this, right? I want to break silos. I want to be collaborative. And I believe that those best practices bundled together are where the real power of them comes to play. And I believe that every person who works in any company can understand the fundamentals of those things and execute within them. And it doesn't have to be pigeonholed into a department. I do more work today with smaller organizations who can't afford to build those departments. And so using this approach helps them get the, the 
bigger bang for the buck because they don't have to build, you know, four different teams to get there. We can do it with, you know, a a, a core team um, within within the smaller organizations. That's one piece of what I do. But what I really am doing that has the most meaning is less consulting and more advising. Some might even say coaching. And it's working with leadership teams to make sure that they are building self-reliance at the highest level, at the middle tier, and distributing some decision-making capability down to the floor and the individual contributors. And that's how we really get businesses that grow and scale. It ties back into using that innovation engine that I talked about. And so I work with individual leaders who are wanting to grow who they are and, and how they perform. And I'm working with leadership teams in groups of five or six people so that we can set a foundation and do it kind of in pods across the organization so that we can seed it in and make it, I plant the seed and let it take root and flourish. That's awesome. Well, I know, so part of the challenges that you solve is like clarity, enablement, and performance. And you said it, I mean, it, it was a, a lot, but it kind of comes down to those three things. Is that right? It does. And so with the work, Rosie, and what you're trying to do, right, for who are we and what is our career all about, right? Having the clarity of understanding what is it? What are we going after? The performance is what are we doing? How well do we do it? What are some things that I do really well that I want to do even better? What are some things that I don't do well that I might want to get rid of? Because we used to try and shore up our weaknesses and make ourselves better in that space. And I think we just need to build on our good things. And the things that we don't do well, there are other people around us who do. And that's where we get to the really cool performance of teams and that collaboration and shoring up for each other. And then all of that, right, the enablement, then you have the, the ability to take your career in the direction that you want it to go, whatever that might be. Growing inside of a corporate environment, stepping into entrepreneurial, you know, there's all sorts of different paths. Some people, right, opt out and let's start teaching because, gosh, we need teachers and there are so many different things that we can do that, you know, if you have the clarity and the performance and then you just need the plan to enable and go where you want to go. Got it. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for spending this time with us. I know you're you're an entrepreneur, you're an author, you're a speaker, you're a podcast host, you're doing so many things. Do you have a favorite? A favorite thing that I'm doing? Yes. I love doing all of these things and that I have multiple personalities in my head and it keeps it all, it keeps it all working so well. But I love having conversations like this and I really working with you know the individuals in that in that coaching and advising space and seeing the growth and that opportunity to go, oh my gosh, I'm I've I've held myself back and I didn't even know I was doing it. Yeah. That is golden for me. So my success is entirely dependent on what happens with my clients and their outcomes and in the coach in the consulting space, right? Every engagement is focused on my clients, customers' needs, so that we're really driving value through the experience. Um, well, I do. I think the biggest thing for me that I appreciate you coaching your clients is for them to listen to their employees and their clients and their customers, because without really understanding the needs of the employees, that's kind of the first phase, and then the needs of the customers, they're never going to get to where they could be. You know, right. Because, you know, the employees are always going to be complaining. The customers are going to be complaining that they're not heard. And it's just going to be, you know, those cycles over and over. So I really appreciate the work that you're doing because it, it definitely makes a difference. So one last thing, Lisa, is there maybe one actionable item that you can recommend? And I know you've already given us a lot for women in their STEM careers to do so they can take action or continue to advance in their careers as soon as they can? So one of the things, and you know, we, we've talked about so many things. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is, I think, critical for all of us at some point in our journey is to have that outside coach and to take the time, whether it's a coach, it's a mastermind, there's lots of different ways to get a perspective that is from outside of your head, that is from outside of your organization, that can truly help you focus on you, what you want, and how you're going to get it. And that's was initially a really weird thing for me to say, and I was really kind of uncomfortable with the idea of it until somebody reminded me, right, our performance athletes 
the people who are at the peak of their game, every one of them has a performance coach that has nothing to do with their sport, but has everything to do with the individual and the mindset. And we normal human beings who get up and go to work and do, you know, life that is not a spectacular celebrity type life, we need that same influence in our lives. Objectivity is the one thing we cannot give ourselves. Absolutely. And and then even just to add to that, when we're kids, we have coaches for Little League, we have coaches for dance and soccer and all the piano and all those things. And then miraculously, we're supposed to be able to know what to do with our careers when we enter the workforce without a coach. And it's just You know, when you think about it that way, it's like, wow, why does that end, you know, when you go to college and then enter the workforce? So that was a very impactful takeaway. So, well, Lisa, again, thank you so much for having this awesome conversation. I love your story. I love everything that you were able to recognize in your career and how you became this powerful disruptor and then ended up breaking away from the corporate world. So kudos to you and then start your your L-cubed consulting firm. So congratulations on everything you have. You have had a spectacular career. So lovely to have you here today. Any final words, Lisa? Thank you so much for inviting me to the conversation. And you know, the easiest way to find me is Lisa L. Levy on LinkedIn. Disrupt and innovate.com is the podcast that there's a there's a free giveaway if you're interested in learning about seven things you should avoid to adapt and thrive. And I look forward to connecting with your audience. Thank you for this opportunity. Sounds great, Lisa. Have a good rest of your day. I thoroughly enjoyed my conversation with Lisa. The main takeaway from this episode for me is the importance of women in STEM fields to advocate for themselves and take control of their careers. This episode highlights the need for women to have a voice, ask for what they want, and not be afraid to reach for higher positions or opportunities. It also emphasized the value of collaboration, innovation, and continuous learning in the corporate world. Lisa provided us with one awesome tip, which is for you to consider having an outside coach and to take the time whether it's with a coach, with the mastermind, group coaching, to understand the different ways to get a different perspective that's outside of your head. I think that's thoroughly important. All of Lisa's contact information will be on the episode website. If you haven't taken my free quiz to figure out how you may be sabotaging your career, the link to the quiz is on the episode website show notes. So with that, remember to be brave, be bold, and take action. Thank you for listening to this episode. Let these stories of self-encouragement and professional development serve as a guide in navigating through corporate America in the most practical and fulfilling way possible. Do not forget to subscribe to the show at nowomanleftbehind.com for more content like this. Leave a rating and share it with your friends because we want to make sure that no woman is left behind. Until I see you next time, remember to be brave, be bold, and take action.